So, Steve, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the online resources for World Extreme Medicine. And um, I'm sure most people watching will know exactly who you are and what you do. For, but for those of those people that don't know who you are um, or might not know so much about your background, it'd be great to hear from you. You know, what brought you to your position that you're in now? So uh, my name's Steve Batchel. I guess now I am primarily a broadcaster working in natural history and expeditions. I started off as a travel writer working for the Rough Guides and then went on to spend five years at the National Geographic as an adventurer in residence. And that was those were my formative years in expeditions. And from there, I moved to uh, doing wildlife and expedition programs with Discovery, with BBC, with Channel 5, with ITV, uh, and with National Geographic as well. It's taken me to every single corner of the planet and uh, allowed me to make first ever descents of whitewater rivers in the Himalayas and uh, in New Guinea and down through uh, the rainforests of Suriname and Guyana uh, to do caving expeditions where we've taken the first ever light into caves that have never been illuminated in tens of millions of years and cave diving expeditions. And I guess to see how much there is still left to do in old fashioned, authentic exploration. And Steve, and I know from my own experience that people, when they when they hear that resume, think it's all very, you know, quite glamorous, quite easy, quite straight, well, not straightforward necessarily, but quite, you know, the perception of reality is slightly different to what we know as our reality. So how have you motivated and, and how do you, you, you know, how do you come up with the new ideas that leave you, lead you on to new, these new challenges? And then how do you achieve those challenges do you look at them as a whole or do you break them down into small into small pieces and and do it that way yeah you've kind of hit the nail on the head with with the end part of your question there i, I think being able to compartmentalize uh, different areas of an expedition is is critical so i would break it down into funding which often is the the most tedious and time consuming of of all the jobs uh, for, for for one idea, uh, there was one particular expedition that I pitched uh, doing the first ever descent of the Balin River in Papua, uh, Western Papua, that I started pitching in 1997, and I got off the ground in 2017. And there wasn't a month went by in all that time that I didn't approach someone to try and get me the funding to, to get that expedition happening. And it just didn't happen. Um I would then go from from funding to to team selection again a, a critical area of any expedition. Anyone who's been on an adventure with someone who doesn't quite work, someone who doesn't quite fit in, will will know exactly what I mean. And conversely, you know those moments where you get a team full of people that you feel entirely happy putting your life in their hands and them doing the same to you. Those are the magic moments when a, an expedition just sings and just works. Selection of, of an expedition, selection of a, of a location and of a specific objective, that's another massive, massive topic that, again, has to be broken down into all its own separate factors. And I think being able to, to organise logistics is, is all about being able to do precise planning and preparation for every single one of those stages are you are you finding that um with this period of isolation that we're undertaking that you're managing to find some of the planning time that in normal life might be quite difficult to find so and are you coming up with new ideas yeah very much so so i'm actually supposed to be away on a a first descent of a whitewater river in in Russia right now. And it's one that we've been working up to for a long time. I've been training for for a long time. Uh, I got myself into the shape that I need to be in for paddling class five. Uh, and instead, I'm, I'm sat at home with my kids. But I think one of the things that I am good at is is knowing, you know, that that old adage of, knowing the things that you can change and the things that you can't and being prepared to accept the one and to get stuck into the other. 
when when I'm in a situation that I can't do anything about, I am quite good at, at just not getting too hung up on it um, and just being able to find the positives in in whatever is my my current reality. My current reality is that I am spending more time in the presence of my my babies and my my toddler than I could ever have dreamed possible with a, with a life like mine. You know, when Logan, my first child, who's now 20 months old, when he was born, I was away on expeditions nonstop. I never had more than a couple of weeks being able to see him growing up. And then I was away for six weeks or two months. And now I have an opportunity to see every single first first smile, first first burp, first um, first exhalation <laughs> from the from the other end, um, and that in itself is a blessing. Likewise, as a as a naturalist, you know I've never had an, a, a a spring where I've been able to be at home looking out my window and be able to go oh. Hang on, the uh, the swallows have just arrived on the eighth of April. That's a week earlier than it was last week, and oh, the caddisflies have just erupted from the river. And I swear that last year that happened two weeks later than this. And you know, just just to to get in touch with the rhythms of my own local patch. Um, and although I'm I'm battling away and trying to find some way to to find work and to fi- to find a way of you know paying the mortgage and paying the bills. Uh, there is an awful lot to be thankful for. Do you think that as, um, and I understand completely what you, what you, what the things you're saying, because having led expeditions, I had the same frustrations with my children when they, when they were young um, and sort of having time with them. Do you think as a result of um, the period we're going through, you all end up changing your outlook on life and changing the way that you live your life? That's a really interesting question. Do you know, I, I found that uh, when when Logan was born, it, it did change everything. You know, it, com- it completely gave me a the meaning of life that I felt like I'd been searching for um, my, my whole life long. All of a sudden, it seemed obvious to me that my my purpose in life was was to be a dad and was to, you know, provide a future for, for him. And uh, there was definitely a a big sea change in my perception and in, in my drives and in my ambitions uh, when that happened. That was a year and a half ago now, and, and I'm still feeling my way through it. You know, I'd, I'd had decades where the only important thing was was getting out on big expeditions and, and you know, the next step in my career. And now all of a sudden that, that doesn't seem so important. This present situation that we're in we're in right now feels a little bit like we're in limbo and when you, when you're in limbo it's really really tricky to um to to give it meaning because you know you are you are just the roots have been tugged out from under us we're not sure how much longer this is going to last how much this is going to affect the future and so i think both helen and i are taking a lot of time to sit down and talk through how this impacts our future as a family, how this impacts the decisions we'll make in the future. And, you know, I don't even know if the job that I'm doing is going to exist in six months time. I don't even know if if the kind of things I do for a living are going to be acceptable ever again. So I, I think it's, it is a time for, for reflection and for, you know, really trying to figure out what the future is going to hold. I mean, it, it has to be said, do you, if, if, and I can't imagine that you won't be in demand post uh, post COVID. But if you if you didn't need to work, you know you're more than welcome to come and join us at World Extreme Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> but, There's an uh, offer right there. I, I uh, could well be uh, taking uh, you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be more than welcome to. I found that when my children arrived, it was it's not similar to you in so much as it felt like life was a, a black and white photograph. And all of a sudden, when Jamie, my first arrived, all of a sudden life was a color photograph. It became richer, deeper, and, and much more meaningful. Um, and I think family comes first, doesn't it? And I think this is an opportunity for lots of people to to probably appreciate that, that actually this is more time than they've spent with their children than in, in many years. Um, and there's a richness and a, and a silver lining to that. Isn't it? Um, can I roll back just to, you were talking about team dynamics and expeditions, and 
How do you, and because this inevitably happens on an expedition, doesn't it? But it also happens in a clinical setting, it happens in an ED department, it happens in GP practices, it happens in medical teams. How do you deal with, because you do have to work with them and get um, high performing teams, how do you deal with somebody with whom you have some friction and um, a sense of disconnection from them? What's your uh, process for that? So I have to say it, it's been a while. You know, we we keep our teams very small. We keep to only using a handful of people who are all multi, multi-skilled and very difficult to replace. And they tend to be people that I've worked with for a long time now and that I know I can trust. Um, but it still happens. You know, you do still get people, even people that you've trusted for a very long time can be going through difficult times in their life or can find a, a particular expedition harder than they ever have done before and you know what I, I think it's probable that over the last couple of years I, I've been that person a few times yeah. there, there have been times when I've been uh, on expeditions that normally I would have considered an absolute breeze but psychologically emotionally um, because because of missing home and missing the kids I've, I've probably been much harder to deal with than normal um, and the number one rule is get it out in the open as quickly as you possibly can. Um, I think that talking about things, getting them them spoken about in a public setting is is essential. The last thing you want is is sniping and people holding grudges um, and people um, just misinterpreting things apart from anything else. You know, it's so, so easy over even just a couple of days to let one comment that might have been totally thrown away and totally meaningless become everything and define your relationship with another person so talk about it you know sit that person down uh with a cuppa and say I, i've noticed you don't seem 100 percent happy is is there anything anything wrong anything that we can we can do about that um and I think what what I've what I've learned tremendously from the people that I really respect in running expeditions is it's about creating a common cause more than anything. It's about letting everyone know that they are a part of a whole and they are working towards uh, the same objectives. So there's um, one specific example that I remember. It's not not from an expedition, but from a filming trip. And we were it was when we were making my my kids wildlife series uh deadly 60 and we normally have about five or six days to make one of those programs and um on one particular series budgets were really tight we were really struggling to do the things we wanted to do um and we really really wanted to go to the bahamas and film tiger sharks which was expensive and the flip side of that was that we had to film a whole show in a day and a half in Louisiana, which is totally unreasonable and would require every member of the team to be working, you know, probably 22 hours, going to sleep for an hour, getting up and working for 10 hours and then get on a plane. Totally unreasonable. And the director got all of us, took us all out for a pint individually, sat us down and went, this is the score. This is the situation. Um, I believe that we as a team are capable of doing this. I believe that each and every one of us has what it takes to work that long day and get this done. If we get it done, then we're on a plane and we're off to the Bahamas and we get to swim with tiger sharks. But I am not going to do this unless every single one of us really, really wants to make it happen. And every single one of us went, yeah, yeah, you're damn right we can do it. Of course we can. We, we've all got what it takes to make that happen. If we hadn't been approached and we'd just gone out on the road and done a 22-hour day, everyone would have been fuming and the whole of the rest of the shoot would have been a write-off. And that that simple twist of just knowing how to how to get people on side and get people working towards a common goal, that, that was a real lesson learned for me. And I think that really applies in a clinical setting, especially when teams are quite often coming together when they when they don't actually know each other. Nightingale Hospital would be a perfect example of that at the moment. It's getting that common cause and communication. I had a, a question. I asked um, some of my my network what uh, if they could ask you a question, what would it be? Um, one of the questions that came out of uh, all of all the places you've been to and the things that you've done. Was there ever an occasion when you just felt, you know, oops, we've gone a little bit too far this time? 
quite quite a few times quite a few times um <laughs> I, I kind of i am very very lucky to still be here in in so it, for so many reasons um I, I think that diving with crocodiles i've done quite a lot of diving with crocodiles and managed to convince myself that in the right situations and with all of the right conditions favoring you that it could be done safely uh and that was true right up until the second that I was diving with a really big crocodile. And all of a sudden, all those rules went out the window. And I realized I'd been conning myself. And actually, we were very, very lucky uh, not to get eaten. Um, the other would be when we were doing our first descent of Whitewater River in Bhutan. I've got a, uh, got a little chum here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> doing, doing the first descent of our Whitewater River in Bhutan, uh, we got forced into running a river, running a, a rapid blind that had never been run before um and we didn't get a chance to recce it we just had to plunge on down through it i got trapped um in a stopper uh, pulled out my boat held underwater for five minutes in uh, in glacial meltwater managing to get up to the surface and grab a breath just you know every every minute or so um and i there was no way i could save myself no way i was i was out of out of out of psych, out of energy, um, totally sapped and drained. And I would not be here speaking to you today if it wasn't for the efforts of Sal Montgomery, my uh, my fellow paddler, who battled upstream, got a line to me and, and pulled me out. And to be able to say that someone truly saved my life is a powerful thing, but she did. And I, I will always, always owe her for that. What was what was going through your mind, Steve, when you were in the stopper? Was it well? What was going through your mind? Um, do you know what? It's it, it it is a question I could probably only answer of this close call because I have had close calls before. You know, I've had rock climbing falls, I've had uh, near misses with with rock fall, um, and sometimes with wild animals as well, and they. It's always quick. It's over in a blink of an eye, and it's only retrospectively that you realise how close you came to something really bad happening. This time round, five minutes is a long time. That is a, a, a long time to be able to go. Okay, I'm going to battle to the surface. I'm going to swim out of this. Oh no, actually, my hands aren't working anymore, and neither are my arms, and uh, I'm drowning. And I can't. You, you know, you actually have time to process it and process what's happening to you. I had time to think about Helen, my wife. I had time to think about Logan, my son, growing up without a father. Um, I had time to think about all of it, and it was it, it was quite a scarring thing because it because it took so long. Um, and you know, I think getting back into the kayak was probably the hardest thing I've ever done because I knew that if I didn't get back in, the expedition was over, um, and I would probably never kayak again. Um, and there was that, could I call it macho? No, I don't think it's a macho side of me. It was, it was that, that kind of dogged, stubborn side of me saying, I don't want to let this beat me. And I, I, I know that I have to get back in now or I never will. Um, and then the rational side of me going, what are you doing? You know, it's only an expedition. You know, why on earth would you honestly risk your life for something so, so trivial? But I am very, very glad that I did get back in the boat and that we did finish off the expedition. Um, it just will always be a moment that um, that I look back at with with dread and with great thanks. An amazing skill from Sal to get back up the river to where you were and rescue you, as well as controlling their own boat, not going into the river themselves. Yeah, so she um, she got up uh, against the rapids. She got a, a she got out of her boat, got a haul line, cl- clambered over the rocks around the side. Um, I think she had one throw because once once she throws, you know, once you throw a haul line out, um, the rope streams out of the out of the bag. To get a decent second throw, you need to recoil it, and that whole process would have taken forty five seconds to a minute. And I didn't have that. I I was definitely right right on the edge there was you know nothing nothing left keeping me at the surface so she had that one throw uh and she got it she hit me bam right in the hand with it uh dragged me out i was still flushed down another three sets of rapids out of the boat and got a really good kicking but 
you know, I, I knew I was going to survive by then. And it just was, <laughs> you know, just pure joy at being out of the thing. And you've lived to tell the tale. Yes. The, um, that brings me on to um, how do you, and I guess your kids are, are, are young, but how do you communicate with Helen and your children about the expeditions you're, you're going on so that they handle the stress of you being away and but also give you the backing that you need in order to pursue the career that you are pursuing yeah um with with helen um i I don't know if you know but helen's and she's a professional athlete um and so for her the big thing is just overwhelming jealousy that she's not on the expeditions herself uh, I, I don't think she has a, a huge amount of, of fear for my safety. She's more thinking, why aren't I going on that? Uh, and so there's, there is there is a degree of having to cushion the blow of, I'm going out to do this incredibly cool thing and I'm leaving you with our, with our babies, uh, which, yeah, I, I, I think is, um, is one that she, she certainly struggles with. I honestly have no idea how... I will get across the things I'm doing to to my kids. I've had a little bit of a taster of it with my with my nephews who are a bit older, and it, you know it was a good. I mean, they were really kind of three, four years old before they they actually made a connection between Steve Backshall that they saw on the telly and Uncle Steve, and that they oh, put okay. the two together and really kind of understood that I was the same person. Um, but you know, my, my little nephew can't watch the stuff where I'm, where I'm doing things that he sees as being dangerous. He just can't watch them. So how am I going to tell my own son when he's five, six years old and the twins, how am I going to tell them that I'm about to go off and free dive with great white sharks? I I don't have an answer to that. (laughs) I I honestly, I, I don't even know where I'll start. We did um we did an interview uh, recently with Blue Rudd, who you might know from Antarctic fame, but who was also um with the Special Forces for twenty five years, and he talked about in his interview how he did kind of um, brief his family about what he was doing and get through that. So one of the things I've been a big advocate for, and I know that you will be or are too, is taking kids on adventures and taking kids outdoors. Um, and I was fortunate enough to take my children <clears throat> with me on a lot of expeditions. And I found the experience I had was like starting the expedition, your expedition career all over again, because all the stuff you see, you saw the first time that really got you into expeditions, you see again for your children's eyes. And it's it's just an amazing experience to sort of re reignite your passion for adventure and stuff. And, and kids are an amazing way of doing that. They also open doors that are completely closed to you as, as a solo traveller or, or as a male traveller. You know, doors just open when you've got children that you'd never, ever go for otherwise. Um, Steve, I know that you're keen to get back to your kids, and it's a nice sunny day, out, sunny day outside. Um, I guess the the one last question I have of you: if you could um, pass a message on to the frontline health workers who are taking the strain of the COVID crisis for us on our behalf, what would that message be? It would be a, a huge, overwhelming thanks. Uh, you are putting yourself into a situation that I cannot even begin to imagine you are doing things that that i find so extraordinary humbling um thank you so so much for all you do i hope that someday i will have a chance to to shake you by the hand although maybe handshaking might not be such a good idea but uh, until such times from me the heartiest of thanks Thank you very much for joining us today. I know your your schedule is busy. You've got kids. You've also got your your other work going on. So thank you for giving us the time today. And we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. You're very welcome. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you.